warning. This episode contains strong language. I get this script of Memento. I don't remember the exact page count, but for the purpose of this story, I will exaggerate so you know what I'm talking about. The script was like 300 pages long. <laughs> so, I'm, I mean, it's like Gone with the Wind. It's like I, it's like I got this, this tome here, you know? It's the <laughs> script that's so thick that if you were a baby, you were five years old, your mom would put that un- underneath you so you would reach the tabletop. It's this gigantic thing. And I'm going like, well, this has got to be the worst damn script in the world. This is terrible. But I promised John Papsidera, the casting director, my agent, okay, I'll read this script. So I sit down, I, I take provisions, food, coffee, alcohol, all sorts of things to try <laughs> to get through this script. And I get through about halfway through, and my wife came upstairs, and I go, damn it, damn it. And she says, terrible. And I go, no, right now, it could be the best script I've ever written. And it infuriates me because I know (laughs) that there is no way the screenwriter can continue this for another 150 pages. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. Okay, I'm, I honestly can't even control my energy right now. I am so excited about this podcast episode. Pro- could be the most excited I've been about a podcast episode we've done. Um, they're all great, right? But the, the, man, this one was so much fun. Okay, okay, I'm just gonna say the name because I'm excited. You just heard, you heard the intro. So you probably already know, if you didn't guess it, well, Stephen Tobolowsky. You think, well, what's that name? I think I've heard that. Boom, if you, if you Google that, you will see his face, right? You will notice, oh my gosh, I've seen this guy in every movie ever, <laughs> right? Like, holy cow, he's, he's a character actor, absolutely amazing. And um, let me tell you some of the things he's been in, okay? Look, he's been in over 200 films. Okay, and my favorites, I'll just throw those out there first, Groundhog Day, okay, he's got that famous, he plays the salesman in Groundhog Day. They just redid the Super Bowl commercial with Bill Murray. So him and Bill Murray redid the Super Bowl commercial, you know, where he comes up to him on the street and whatever, you know, love that. And then Memento, he's the guy in Memento um, that's, that loses his memory, right? The black and white scenes about the guy that loses his memory, that's him, that's Stephen Tobolowsky. Um, so talk to him about working with Christopher Nolan, talk to him about working with Bill Murray and on Groundhog Day, talk to him about just so many other stuff. So, okay. So here's some of the movies he's, he's been in. Okay. And, and, and granted, these are not just some of these maybe earlier roles are just like tiny little role, but then they're like, you know, he's got big roles. Okay. in some of these movies, all right. Philadelphia experiment, phenomenal movie. Nobody's fool. Oof, Spaceballs. That's right. He's captain of the guard in Spaceballs. You remember that scene? Come on. Oh my God. Yeah, that's Steven. Mississippi Burning. Checking out, breaking in. Great balls of fire. Remember that? In country. What about Bird on a Wire? Remember that Mel Gibson movie with, with Goldie Hawn? I do, because I used to love that movie. Yeah, he's the one of the bad guys in the movie. Like, <laughs> I love that movie so much. I actually rewatched it knowing that I was going to interview him and we didn't even get to talk about it. Um, uh, Welcome home, Roxy Carmichael, The Grifters, Mirror Mirror, Thelma and Louise. He's Max in Thelma and Louise. Uh, Basic Instinct. Yep. He's Dr. Lamott. That's him. Okay. (laughs) I mean, come on. Uh, Single white female, Roadside Profits, Sneakers. I forgot to ask him about Sneakers. I love that movie. Uh, Robert Redford, Dan Aykroyd, River Phoenix, rest in peace. Sidney Poitier, how could I forget? Phenomenal movie. Um, 
Yes, and he's in that. Uh, great. Josh and Sam, Calendar Girl. That was a good one. Jason Priestley, The Pickle, Romeo's Bleeding, Groundhog Day. There he is. Trevor. I- I'm only in the early 90s, guys. Radio Land Murders, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Glimmer Man. Uh, I'm not even naming them all. I'm just trying to go through and find the ones y'all might know. Mr. Magoo, Black Dog, um, The Insider. Remember that movie with uh, Russell Crowe, The Insider? Pff, that is a effing good movie. That's a great movie. Memento. Boom. There he is. Bossa Nova. Stanley's gig. The day the world ended. Um, national security. Okay. I'm just going to stop. I guess I could just keep going and going and going. But he also did these cool. Um, uh, he's also a great TV shows on Deadwood. Okay. So he knew Jim Beaver that had come on uh, the episode. So check that episode out that we did with Jim Beaver. Um, so yeah, he worked with, with Jim on Deadwood. Uh, he's all was also on heroes. Okay. Um, he was on, he's on glee. He's on California occasion with Stu Beggs. Um, he was also action Jack Barker on Silicon Valley. He was so funny on that show and he's great on California. He's great on everything. And California case, was so good but on Silicon Valley, man. He was so, so good. Um, and he's got a podcast. So check that out too, guys. This guy's just amazing. He told the greatest stories. I could have listened to him forever. That is no lie. He told the best stories. It starts off with him like showing me a piece of rock from the Berlin Wall, right? And then it just gets crazier from there. Did you know that he, I'm going to let him tell the story, but he's got an unbelievable story about Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yes, that Stevie Ray Vaughan. Because Steven was also a musician in the early days. Yes. So wait till you hear that story of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Okay, it's unbelievable. Uh, I, you know, I'll give you a little tease. Look, it's like the first time he ever re- laid down a track. Okay, it was with Steven. That's right. The first time Stevie Ray Vaughan ever laid down a track was with Steven Tobolowsky. And he tells this phenomenal story about that. <sighs> anyway, so many good stories, guys, in this, in this. I just, oh my God, it was absolutely amazing. It was great seeing him. And you're going to know who he is and, and love him even more. And he's from Dallas. Great guy. Great guy. Really enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah. So, Stephen Tobolowsky. I was, I was kind of going out in a daze there for a second because it was, I mean, this guy's been in everything. Everything I love. So many things I wanted to talk to him about. I just didn't have the time. You know, sometimes podcasts are like that. There's so much I want to talk to that person about. We just don't have the time. You know, the truth is, I'll give you a little inside tip, guys. It's really, I can get out about four to six topics a podcast that's usually you know main topics that, that's usually about all we get so anyway all right time before we get to the episode it's time for as always bet you didn't know that segment so we are sponsored by texas real food go to texasrealfood.com enter your zip code find all the greatest places around you that are you know butchers farmers markets you know organic places okay and there they are go around there you put in the zip code boom it brings it up super awesome so because of that because of texas real food we do this segment called bet you didn't know that so you know on their on their instagram follow them on social media texas real food they like to just put up these cool food facts that's why i I love following them on social media like you know a lot of times you just don't want to follow your own stuff because it's just like ah boring see it all the time no this is awesome i'm always curious what they're going to put up and what sort of food facts so here we go first one bet you didn't know Goats are picky eaters. They don't like eating food that is dirty. Okay? That's the sassy goats, okay? Uh, <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, I'm not eating this. This is dirty. Nah. Wait, is that a goat? I don't know what sounds goat make. Anyway, so always trust goat cheese. So you know you're going to get that, you know, the filter. That goat's like, mm, only good stuff going in here. All right, next one. What do you think it's going to be? Yeah, how are you going to All right, next one. Bet you didn't know pigs have 15,000 taste buds while humans only have 9,000. Ooh. So pigs could become psalms, psalmiers, uh, could become chefs, right? Great palates. 15,000 taste buds. We only have 9,000. Although I think I've met people with literally nine taste buds uh, before. So that's interesting. All right. Bet you didn't know a hard-boiled 
wait, hard boiled eggs spin. So uncooked or soft boiled don't. There you go. So spin the egg. If it's if it's hard boiled, it'll spin. If it's uncooked or soft boiled, not gonna do it. Why do you think that is? I can tell you right now. Because all the stuff inside of it, it's moving around. Got that yolk, right? Weight is getting distributed, all kinds of crazy. But when it's hard boiled, it's st weight is secure, so it's gonna spin. That logically makes sense. You see how I broke that down like I know what I'm talking about? I don't. I don't. All right, next one. Okay, this is kind of ridiculous. This is a ridiculous one, Texas Real Food, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it, but it's ridiculous. Bet you didn't know, farm to fork restaurants get their food from local farms. Okay, I'm pretty sure people knew that. So I bet you didn't know that one. <laughs> that's a, come on, Texas. That's the first one I've ever seen where I'm like, that's. <laughs> It's kind of funny. Maybe it's just funny to me. Farm to fork restaurants. Okay, so, or you, you might hear them known as farm to table. Um, but yes, it, literally, of course, they better be. Okay, last one. No, oh, two more. Bet you didn't know the word for dinner used to mean breakfast. Hmm. What? Wait a second. The word for dinner used to mean breakfast. I'm not sure I get that, but breakfast break fast. You fasted all night, you've been sleeping, and then you, it's the first meal of the day. Break fast. Dinner? Supper, maybe? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Dinner, diner, dinner, dinner. What does dinner mean? The fuck does dinner mean? You know, that's what we need to find out. What does dinner mean? We're gonna Google that. Google that, I'm Googling it. We're Googling it later. I'm not going to tell you right now, but, you know, that, that's your homework. Go find out what dinner means. What dinner? What Really? I mean, we know what it means, but where did it come from? Why that name? Okay, last one. Bet you didn't know. 80% of Texas grapes are grown in Texas high plains. Boom. Not sure you needed to know that, but now you do. All right. 80% of Texas grapes grown in the Texas high plains, baby. Boom. It's probably like California and Napa Valley gets, you know, most of the... Uh, grape grown there. All right, that's it. So hope you enjoyed that, guys. Thank you so much. All right, uh, last thing before we go about Texas Real Food. Don't forget, they do these cool articles uh, and stuff on the site. So you go to texasrealfood.com slash discover. And um, yeah, you can find recipes, articles, reviews of like food podcasts or books or you know so everything food related is awesome i mean there's just all kinds of great articles to make something or this or that yeah, honestly there's just so many resources on this site i'm not just saying that because they sponsor us I, I i legitimately mean that um so yes so right now there's a super cool um Look, there's going to be a lot of Christmas stuff coming up, so I'm going to focus on that. It's a really cool Christmas article, okay, so that you can get right now. It's basically 15 Christmas gifts for anyone who's passionate in the kitchen. So go check that out. That's a good article. And get some gifts. And there's cool recipes and stuff on there, too. So, uh, eh? let's, uh, what do you say we get to the episode, guys? Yeah? Okay. But before that, <laughs> don't forget about our website, thelonestarplay.com. Stay connected to us, to me. Let us know. If you have any questions, you want to reach out to me, Patrick at TexasRealFood.com. Let me know. Send me a question about the podcast. You want us to have a particular guest? You just want to ask me something? I'll answer it on the air. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for supporting us. And um, I think y'all are going to be ready for this podcast. So let's just get to it. Here we go. Stephen Tobolowski, The Amazing. Okay, Stephen Tobolowski. Enjoy. I'm here. Hello. Hello, sir. Continue meeting. Let's go. And let's see, my video must be on. Video's on. Yep, everything's perfect. Looks great. Love that background. Thank you so much. It's, it's you know, the virtual bookshelf. I was one of the first people to use it. And now everybody's using a bookshelf behind them. Right. <laughs> make it look like you read a lot. See, my books are hidden. I put them hidden because I was like, I don't want anybody to see the books that they that I'm reading. Really, it's, <laughs> right? They're not impressive uh, by no means. They're about tacos. I mean, it's, the thing that's very impressive about my bookshelf is I don't know if you could see this. I'm gonna move my screen around a little bit. So you yeah. Maybe see, is that 
there's different piles of crap encroaching <laughs> on the bookshelf at different places. <laughs> like we've got, I, I mean, really now it's becoming more like a vertical feast than, than yeah. <laughs> you know, right <laughs> here. I'm pointing here, like here. I see it. Here. It's is part that? of the Berlin Wall. Wow. Yes. This is the kind of crap I, I love it. My bookshelf. <laughs> in a plastic baggie. That's my favorite part. Yeah, <laughs> it's been in that baggie for years. I love it. That's awesome. That is so cool. That is so cool. Well, listen, Stephen, this is I, I can't tell you how excited I am to uh, talk to you. Um, I, I've really been looking forward to this interview since they told me we booked this. Uh, to be frank with you. Um, yeah, really looking forward to this. Um, and, you know, was I'm always surprised to find out who's from Texas and, you know, hear their story and how they got to it's It's just always amazing to me. And you grew up in Dallas, if I'm not correct. Is that is that right? Right. Uh, Oak Cliff. So, you know, that's about 20 miles outside of downtown Dallas, kind of to the what is it? South and West, somewhere like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, Oak Cliff. So that would be Kimball High School, South Oak Cliff High School, kind of that Sunset High School. Wow. Yeah, you know, that's uh, changed a lot since then. Yeah, and, and you know, back, back in those days, I think uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, I think Stevie and Jimmy went to Sunset, I think, even though they were kind of from our neighborhood. And, that is uh, so cool. Yeah, you know. And you played with, uh, that, that's something I read, it had zero idea. I mean, I grew up watching you and so, so much. I mean, I've seen you in so many things. It's crazy. But then I was like, what, Stevie Ray Vaughan? What? He played on your song? This is crazy. Tell us a little bit about this. Oh, oh for real? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, <laughs> we, were, we were a really terrible folk rock group. We were really bad. We were called Cast of Thousands because that was in movies at that time, like Ben-Hur and Spartacus Cast of Thousands. So we thought like, you know, Cost of Millions is how they used. And uh, so we got through Bobby Foreman, who was the only real musician of the group, uh, Tempo 2 Studios in Dallas. You've heard of them, I'm sure. They we're going to record garage bands before the age of garage bands in Dallas and cast of thousands was picked so everyone on the album was doing two songs so we're on our way over to record and bobby says well i got a kid from the neighborhood uh, stevie vaughn to play lead guitar on our two songs and i'm going wait 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 stevie vaughn how old is stevie vaughn and yet you know because i knew you know jimmy and steve you know we knew him you know kind of from around the neighborhood and he goes well he's 14 i go bobby bobby look we could play guitars we don't need any kid playing on our guitar now this is on the way to the studio to record bobby's in the front seat i'm in the back and bobby turns around and looks at me and says steven shut up <laughs> he says this kid stevie he's so good he's gonna make us sound like we know what we're doing you know and and so uh we That's we so got funny. to the tempo two studios do you want me to continue this story yeah of course yeah, yes this yes. story does continue is that uh, uh, <laughs> Stevie was sitting there in a metal folding chair with a red Gibson in his lap with the dual humbucking pickups. And, and he was kind of like just leaning back in the chair looking like he needed a haircut or something. And uh, he said, so guys, I don't know like what we're doing here. So why don't you play a little bit of your song so I can figure out what I'm doing. And we did, so we started playing our first song, Red, White, and Blue, which is what that song was. And Stevie stopped after about eight seconds. Okay, okay, <laughs> we got, okay, okay, hold it, okay. I got it. So this is kind of a crappy song. So what if I start with kind of a crappy lead and then go into a good lead? And uh, we said, oh, well, sure, Stevie, whatever. We, and we recorded it like the Beatles. This is the only uh, kind of analogy I'm going to make to the Beatles in the entire recording here. But, <laughs> but we, stood, we all stood around the microphone, and we recorded the whole damn song with the guitars and everything all at once in one take. We got the master take. Stevie didn't play. 
you know, we just did all of our uh, rhythm guitar and bass and vocals and harmonies, etc. Then the engineer said, okay, son, you ready to do a lead? And Stevie goes, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, he kind of stood stood up and they played it and then he started doing this real crappy lead you know really funny stupid crappy lead and then he goes into this blistering eric clapton sort of lead and we're all like huh huh and i'm looking at bobby and bobby is like <laughs> nodding at me going like like you see what i told like, you i told you yeah, yeah yeah i told you man <laughs> so anyway stevie does that lead and uh the recordist, I'm looking now through the glass window, and it's a grown-up. You know, they have grown-ups back then who are doing recording. And he's kind of, his mouth is agape, and he goes, uh, Son, that was uh, pretty good. Uh, do you have another one you want to do? And Stevie <laughs> goes, well, do you, want it, do you want it more Eric Clapton or you want it more Jimi Hendrix? Well, uh, just, yeah, just do something different. Okay, man. So I went through again, and Stevie played another amazing, blistering lead. And now the guy who's recording, the guy who's behind the desk, stands up, and I'm watching him run to the door, open the door, and yell silently down the hallway and gesture, come here, come here, you have to see this. And wow. other grown-ups started running into the recording room behind the double double-pane glass, and they start looking, and the uh, Stevie finished that lead, and the recordist goes, uh, son, got any more in you? And Stevie goes, I could do this all day. <laughs> says, well, why don't you play a few more? So then Stevie did one of those leads where he goes way low on the low bass notes, then zips up way up to the high notes and does a counterposto kind of thing of doing the low and the high and back and forth. And now I'm standing beside the recording window. I'm looking in there. There are about eight grown-ups in there with their mouths open, with the light of the recording studio on their faces looking like they've just been hit by a revelation. And I realized (laughs) it was the first time any of us, anyone in that room, had seen the real thing. And by the real thing, I don't mean like a real good guitarist. I mean it was the first time we saw genius wow and when you see that for real there's no coming back from it you realize one that it exists and that's good news and then you realize how far away you are from that (laughs) and that is sort of bad news but (laughs) it is true that stevie did make us sound like we knew what we were doing and that is the first studio recording of stevie ray vaughn is with the cast of thousands really oh yes on this wow and i still have a few of them here at home and then i'm selling for the top dollar for for for, you know uh but it was amazing and at that particular time i figured i was going to be an actor i figured that since i was about five but now i was thinking genius has this ability to make you think you are part of it And I, I, I remember, uh, I told my uh, girlfriend or who I hoped to be my girlfriend at the time that I just, uh, cut some hot wax and I may be a rock star soon. So I may be leaving this acting thing behind and be headed on the road with, uh, canned heat and some of those other bands, (laughs) you know, of course, (laughs) you, you know, that was that was kind of the last time I saw Stevie until, I want to say it's something like 17 or 18 years later, I am now a professional actor, and I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, shooting Great Balls of Fire. And oh, wow. Jimmy, Great film. And Jimmy's in the movie, right? So Jimmy and I are clowning around every night. Every night we are being relatively bad boys, as you could be in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh they had a recording studio, Kiva Recording Studio, which basically handed the keys over to Great Balls of Fire 
for, for any and all recordings we needed to do. So we had access to it 24 hours a day. So Jimmy oh, wow. and I would go over there and just monkey around and play songs. Uh, Trey Wilson had a bunch of songs. And we just, you know, turn on the record and just start wow. recording stuff. Anyway, Jimmy and I finished recording at about dawn one morning. <laughs> And so we just, you know, when you leave the recording studio and the sun is coming up, you figure you've done a good day's work. <laughs> so we, Jimmy and I thought we'd go get breakfast. So we go to this little diner in Memphis. It's empty except for Stevie Ray Vaughan. No way. Sitting, oh, sitting in the place. So Jimmy goes, oh, my God, it's Stevie. And then Jimmy says to me, come with me. Uh, I want you to meet Stevie. I go, oh, well, I know Stevie. <laughs> You know, I, I know him, Jimmy. Uh, actually, Stevie and I, we've recorded together. And so Jimmy and I descend on Stevie at the table. And I go, Stevie, remember Stephen Tobolowsky, cast of thousands, red, white, and blue. Remember, I heard a voice last night. We, we cut that tempo to record. And Stevie looks at me. It's 6 a.m. And he's kind of looking at me. He says, man, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. I go, oh, oh, sorry. And it was at that breakfast, Stevie and Jimmy had had some sort of parting of the ways over something. And it was at that breakfast that Jimmy was saying, Stevie, all I want to do is play with you. That's all I want to do. If we could put everything behind us, just let's play together. And it was at that breakfast that Jimmy and Stevie started planning Family Style, that album. Wow. And at that point... I uh, lost my playmate is is because uh, because Jimmy, you know, when he wasn't rehearsing or shooting Great Balls of Fire, he was working with Fabulous Thunderbirds in town, and they were rehearsing and all sorts of stuff. So Fabulous Thunderbirds would come to the set. I mean, it was really for me kind of rock and roll heaven. And wow. from that point on, Jimmy started working with Stevie, writing and playing over. At, at the studios and, and laying the basic tracks down. And I guess the aftermath of the story is we had finished Great Balls of Fire. I went back to LA, still kept in touch with everybody because we were pretty close. We had been together for a few months and uh, there was the crash. And, uh, wow. and Jimmy came over Jimmy came over to the house, and it was amazing. The album had brought Stevie and Jimmy together again, and there were more benefits to that. Eric Clapton, who was Jimmy's idol, had asked Stevie if Stevie would play with him at this concert, I guess in Minnesota or somewhere, wherever that was. And so Stevie asked Jimmy, if he wanted to play with Eric Clapton and him. So Jimmy, wow. Stevie, Eric Clapton played at that rock concert up in, and I don't know where that was, but at the end of the concert, they have all the helicopters for the guys to leave, and Stevie's in the helicopter, Jimmy jumps on the helicopter, and Jimmy's wife, Connie, jumps on the helicopter, and the pilot says, ma'am, we have too much weight, you'll have to wait for the next... Uh, helicopter and so Connie leaves and then Jimmy says I go where my wife goes he got off the helicopter oh and Jimmy tells me that like the helicopter didn't make it like 50 feet in the air when suddenly it lost control came crashing down fireball and everything and that was it and he said now he is editing and uh, that is what you call it in albums Produce it. You know, he, he's putting the tracks together for the album, he said, as his uh, grieving process. He's, he's, uh, he said wow. it was all he had to try to come to grips with the loss. So it was, it was one of those stories that begins as something so goofy when we're kids, then turns into something so magnificent with brothers uniting, and then ends with tragedy and reconciliation. It, it's, it's Greek 
in its size, in its scope. <laughs> it's mythic. Uh, wow. But those guys, those two guys, had probably more talent than a lot. I mean, they came from Oak Cliff. Yeah, it's crazy. 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 Unbelievable yeah. story. Yeah. Unbelievable experience. Um, you know, I can't imagine what it would have been like to work on the music afterwards. I, I know it must have been cathartic and therapeutic, but that must have been tough to be listening to that and enjoying it. And, you know, like at the same time, ooh, I can't imagine. And, the, 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 you know, it just as a side note to that time, you are reminding me of this. That side note in history, Trey Wilson, who also wrote a lot of songs and was singing stuff in, in Memphis, he played my brother in that movie. Uh, he played Sam Phillips and I was Judd Phillips, uh, the producers of Jerry Lee Lewis. And Trey had a, got another movie, Miller's Crossing, in New Orleans right after we did Great Balls of Fire. And so Trey went down to shoot like the first week or something in Miller's Crossing. Then he came back to Memphis, and I run into him in the parking lot of our hotel, and he's carrying boxes. And so I go, what is this? He says, well, I'm going down to shoot Miller's Crossing, and these are all the songs I wrote, and these are all the recordings, and I'm going to keep them down at Kiva. And so on my days off, I'll come up from New Orleans, come up to Memphis, and finish these songs up. So I go, great. I go back in. Uh, we go on a hiatus over Christmas, and then some of the cast is meeting in London, London, England, uh, for those who are interested in jet-setting actors. So we, we went to London for three or four weeks at the end of January. Wow. And right before Trey left, we... Trey and I shot a scene together where I'm in London and he's in America and I'm telling him how the Jerry Lee Lewis concert is going. So we shot Trey's footage and I'm off camera and pretending to be the other side of the phone call. In the three-week hiatus, Trey went back to New York to kind of be with his wife over, the vaca over Christmas vacation. Cerebral hemorrhage dies oh. in bed. It, you know, he said, baby, I have a headache. He goes upstairs, lies down in bed, and never gets up again. Oof. So we go to London. Dennis Quaid held a memorial service for Trey, but we had to keep shooting. And the first scene I had to shoot now was my part of the phone call oh, with man. Trey. And all we had was Trey's footage, the last footage he made. And then you have, we're all trying to hold it together to do, to do this stupid scene in this goofy movie where we just lost one of our cast members. And we're in London, and we, we connect uh, via the telephone. It was before the age of these Apple phones. So we had a phone with a plug and a cord with Trey's wife, in New York, and she joined us for the memorial service we had for Trey, and she said, I just wish that we had Trey's songs because, you know, he wrote a lot of songs, and I said, and I'm, we're all sitting in the circle on the floor, I said, you don't know. And she goes, what? Oh, my God. I saw Trey. I saw Trey in the parking lot. He was taking boxes of songs to Kiva Recording Studios. Go to Kiva Recording Studios in Memphis, Tennessee, and there is a box of all of Trey's songs there in the studio. Wow. And so she flew to Memphis, and damn it, there they were. And in a way, in another mythic Greek uh, bit of a story, his wife was able to recover, was able to get her final wish and get Trey's songs. Wow. It was, it was amazing. Oh man, that's so tragic. Um, yeah, that's, that must've been very difficult to go through, uh, for yourself too. In that scene, doing that, uh, the cast, the crew, everybody just, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. I can't I mean, imagine. We, we were wrecked. Terrible. Yeah, I can't, can't imagine.
Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a, you know, I'm a very emotional person. I can't even imagine being able to do something like that. I would have just said, uh, this guy's, it's not happening. I, I, yeah, I, you know, my, I wear my emotions right here, as they say, right. It's so, but that, you know, you're a professional, so I'm sure, you know, you, you worked it out, you know, which is what you do. Um, you know, speaking of, um, I was watching, uh, I actually watched Memento again today. I hadn't seen it in, I don't know, 10 years. Uh, but when it had came out, I saw it a million times. I mean, I, I absolutely loved that film. And, you know, it reminded me of, you know, what, first of all, what a great film it is, but how integral really your part is to that movie, to be honest. Yeah, with. it, th that part is really, Sammy Jenkins is really the gift in that movie. And if you take a look at all of Chris's films, uh, there's always one kind of part that seems to be a splinter and a piece of wood. Like it seems to be this <laughs> small part and it always provides a gift to the movie. Uh, something- wow. Love the way you put that. If, if, that. If, you, if, you, if you look at that, it really is magnificent. It's a terrific film, oh, and it was it was one of those films that, you know, when I got the script, I, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with movie scripts, like standard movie script. First draft is a hundred twenty pages, and the producers hate you for that, and they want to <laughs> batter it down to a hundred ten or even ninety eight if they can, but the first draft is a hundred twenty pages. I get this script of Memento. I don't remember the exact page count, but for the purpose of this story, I will exaggerate so you know what I'm talking about. The script was like 300 pages long. <laughs> so I'm, I mean, it's like Gone with the Wind. It's like I, <laughs> it's like I got this, this tome here, you know, it's the <laughs> script that's so thick that if you were a baby, you were five years old, your mom would put that underneath you so you would reach the tabletop. It's this gigantic thing, and I'm going like, well, this has got to be the worst damn script in the world. <laughs> this is terrible. But I promised John Papsidera, the casting director, my agent, okay, I'll read this script. So I sit down, I, I take provisions, food, coffee, alcohol, all sorts of things to try <laughs> to get through this script. And I get through about halfway through, and my wife came upstairs, and I go, damn it, damn it. And she says, terrible. And I go, no, right now it could be the best script I've ever written. And it infuriates me because <laughs> I know that there is no way the screenwriter can continue this for another 150 pages. It's ridiculous. It just infuriates me. So anyway, wow. Anne leaves. Wow. I, I get to. That. I get to the end of the script and I throw the script across the room and it smashes against the wall and Anne came running up like I'd just killed the cat or something. And she came in and said like, what is it? Was it terrible? And I said, best script I ever read. Amazing. And the reason the script was so long, it was a combination, I guess, Shoot, it had to be of a shooting script and regular textual script to where each scene described blow by blow how the cameras set in exactly the same place for this scene as the previous scene. And it's going over Sammy's shoulder to Sammy's wife. And then the, we see the couch in exactly the same. It's all described. So as the reader, you see, oh, we are... Are we going back in time? Is this is this some sort of weird time travel movie? And it takes you there, and it was it was spectacular, spectacular script, thrilled. Wow, yeah, that's unbelievable. So at that time, you know, this is Christopher Nolan's right first big movie. He had made um, Following, I think that's what it's called. The first yeah, one. He, he he made one before. I think yeah. this is the one that really kind of put him on the map. Yeah, put, put him on the map. So okay, so for you, you're like, okay, the script is so good. I, I don't really know the director, but this script is so good, and you know, you just decided to go with it, right? So did you know at that time that was the character you're reading for? Or did you read for yes. another character? Well, they told me I was re uh, reading for Sammy Jenkins, and I called my agent up immediately, and I said, set a meeting up with Chris Nolan. I have to go in on this. 
I wow. have to go in on this. So I went in and I met Chris and sat down and I, I just said like, incredible script, threw it across the room, <laughs> best script. I, uh, I said, I, 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 need, I need to be in, in this movie. And he said, well, you know, there, we, there's not a lot to read for Sammy Jenkins. I said, well, I'm not going to read for you, Chris. I said, because, yeah, you're right. There's no real scene to read except me getting electrocuted by the guy who's testing me, you know, and I go, great it. scene. Great yeah. scene. I love that scene so much. Yeah, yeah with Tom Lennon. That, that was a great scene. And, uh, and I said, but this is why I want to be in this movie. When actors in L.A. read this script, everybody is, is going to want to be in this movie. And they will all be good actors. But I have one thing I think that no other actor that sees you will have. And I am the only actor you are going to meet who's actually had amnesia. I know what it is. And Chris goes, you have? I said, yeah, I had an operation for kidney stones and over at Cedar sinai Hospital, and they used an experimental drug on me as a general anesthesia. And the purpose of this drug was for big guys like me, because I'm 6'3", 200 pounds, you know, that they give this drug to big people so you don't have little nurses having to lift people from one uh, bed to another bed. You just tell the big galoot, get up out of the bed, walk, get in that bed. They follow orders, but they immediately forget. It is a medicine that gives you amnesia. So, you know, they take you to the operating room, and they apparently said, Stephen, get up off of this and get on the operating table. You obey, you get there, and you immediately forget what it is. And, and you wow. feel the pain of the operation, but you forget it's, oh just like, it's just like a bad relationship. <laughs> you know, it's like you feel it. It keeps coming back on you like pepperoni pizza at two in the morning. But you forget. You forget. And so I said, Chris, just like any other general anesthetic you have, it takes like a week or so for it to work out of your system afterwards. So when my wife brought me home from the hospital, I still had this stuff in my system. So I would be like born, boom, born at this moment and I'm standing in our living room and I'm holding half of a glass of water. Just at that moment I was born. And I did not know if I had drunk half of the glass of water and was returning the half a glass to the kitchen to get more or if I was mid-drink, I didn't know where I was. And I would need help to go for, like the worst was when I. Oh, went, hey, that sounds I horrifying. Went, <laughs> I went to I went to the potty, and you, you know, and apparently I did, because <laughs> boom, I am born this moment, this moment I didn't exist beforehand, and now I'm standing over the toilet and I'm holding little Steve in my hand, and I am looking, and I cannot figure out if I had just peed, if I was about to pee, if I should zip up and leave, what I should, I did not know where I was in the process. And my wife is in the bedroom in the next room and she goes, you finished 10 minutes ago, zip up and get out. <laughs> so, so I knew what it was to have, to be born in that moment and not know where you were, or what you were doing. Yeah, and, wow, and that's, that's crazy. I know, and, and that's why I told Chris before on subsequent meetings, I said that Memento, even though it was not a huge part, it was the most difficult role I ever played to try to recapture the, the real feeling of amnesia of where, not where you're not where you're trying to remember. That's the way actors always play. Where am I? What am No, you're born. <laughs> You're born that one moment. The moment beforehand doesn't exist, and you are just born, and you're innocent. And, you know, you're there with the TV changer, and you see, oh, TV changer. You look up TV, 
And at that point, the TV's on, and then you forget, oh, there's a TV changer in my hand. But each moment, you're born anew, and it's very difficult to recreate that without overacting. You, I mean, you crushed it. This, you know, the you mentioned the TV that that one scene about in the TV in the movie that that one particular clip really encapsulates that where you're angry about changing the channel of something, but your face isn't angry. It just looks like I don't understand what's going on. I'm change it, and then you see the commercial, and you're happy. You, you get the storyline of it. It was perfect. It just like completely encapsulated everything. Um, no, you, you did that perfectly. I mean, it's, yeah. It's it, it, was, it was a phenomenal movie. I didn't understand the movie. Yet, you know, when I went to see the final version of the movie, I knew it was great and didn't understand it. I went with my son, Robert, who was 12 at the time, and he explained it to me. as. We <laughs> I love that. He, he that said, is... <laughs> Dad, everything Teddy says is true. And Teddy is the Joey Panleone character. He says, everything Joey says is true. So all you have to do is listen to that one character, and he clues you as to where you are in the story. Wow. And I went Smart like, wow, kid. I, oh, yeah. I had no idea. He's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's so, uh, yeah, you know, again, just watching it recently, I'm still confused. There's still confusing parts to me, um, it, but it moves so beautifully the way it's, it's just so, it's still to this day, such a, you know, the way it's structured is still so odd. And even that first beginning scene uh, shot where the Polaroid and you realize it's going backwards. Just so cool. Uh, just, just such a great, uh, yeah, just such a great movie. Um, you know, I, I'm curious what it's like in the room with, with uh, Christopher when you're actually doing it. Is he, you know, very kind of, you do your thing. He's very stick to this. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious about that. Well, as, as just like as a person, he's very much a bon vivant and, and you know, very uh, joyous kind of intense fellow, you know, very determined to do his, his work. When you're shooting a scene, he, he is in it. He is in it inside out like he is coming up with coverage and how he wants to shoot it and coming up with new ideas of how to shoot it in the moment. Oh, wait a minute, this looks great. What if we did this? What if we change lens? And, and he's there working with you in the moment. But he's got a plan. He's got a plot. But at the same time, he also has, you know, kind of the, the courage to make calls on the fly and, and change the coverage of, of the shooting. But I got to say, the, the set with Chris and with Guy, and and it was a joyous set. We we had a phenomenal time shooting oh, that movie. We had a great awesome. time. Yeah, that's great to hear. That's great to hear. Yeah, Guy Pierce, he's uh, he's unbelievable. L L.A. Confidential. I always, I just love that movie so much. He's so great in that. And then Memento. Yeah, he he uh, crushes it. Um, you know, I'm curious. You mentioned directors like working. You know, having that set, setting that sort of setup, and you've worked on so many, you know, sets, be it film, TV. I mean, just a, amazing. You know, just to go through the list is impossible. We, I could literally spend a whole podcast just listing everything you've been in. Uh, I'm curious what sort of sets you're most attracted to, uh, whether you know, and what sort of sets you're not attracted to. You know, working on. Well, you ne you never know till you get there, uh, like. Like for me, I'm a creature of comfort. And so if there's a, a movie script with a lot of night shoots in it, I'm not attracted to that. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's difficult. So you know it's a night shoot if like you're on a date with someone at a restaurant at night. Yeah. That probably starts shooting at 8 o'clock at night and finishes at 3 or 4 in the morning. Got you. Okay. You know, as, if it's dark outside, they use the darkness. And if if it's winter, uh, you, you know, you have more darkness. And if it's summer, you have less. So you will you will use up every. I remember I did a hutch rhyme, sleep easy hutch rhymes, and we had a pool party. Uh, the the scene took place quote in the summer. We were shooting in Los Angeles, I think, in January or February. So <laughs> we're all kind of dressed for swimming at night. And 
I have a phony cocktail in my hand with fake ice cubes in it. And, you, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting around the pool. It's night. There's a hot tub going. People are, stunt people are going in the water because, you know, they're like, you know, Alaska, the, you know, 50s, 50th state. You know, they're doing like one of those documentaries on people like, you know, dying up in Alaska. So we're standing by the swimming pool. I'm wearing shorts. I'm wearing like a little beach shirt. It's 20 degrees outside. I'm pretending to drink a cocktail. We have to have conversation without our jaws chattering. And then, you know, they call cut and we all run to the side and they have costume people with giant winter down coats to throw it on us in between shots. So when you see a night shoot and when you see night shoot uh, around a pool, you know it's going to be just terrible. Uh, but one thing I learned as a general rule, like the greater the director, you know, in a way, the bigger reputation, the more magnificent the director, the easier it's going to be and the more fun you're going to have. Like wow. working with like Ridley Scott, working with Chris Nolan, you know, working with Barbe Schroeder, you, you know, working with really super great directors it's all easy you know they have it all down they they know how to work with the actors it works beautifully it's delicious you have a wonderful time if you're working with uh people that uh are used to let's say making tv movies and they're making the jump to feature films that can be difficult you know, because they're used to, they're the dog, the country dog that's been hit too much yeah. by TV movies. And so they're like, they're very difficult and intractable to work with. And they wanted a scene a certain way and they wanted. And I remember I did one movie and that I had a gun and I was approaching somebody and, and the director was saying, okay, we're using a very uh, tricky lens here, so it's not a real lens, so don't point the gun at the person because it doesn't look like you're pointing the gun at the person. Uh, Point the gun more at the ground by his feet, and the lens is warped and look like you're actually aiming at him. And also, also, the, the lens warps the scene, so if you could crouch, if you could crouch, and also your left side is is a little too high if you could make your left side lower than your right side and bend your knees and if you could kind of walk and (laughs) aim at the ground (laughs) when you shoot him so i'm feeling like rumple stiltskins right (laughs) you know i'm i'm like going i can't I have no sense of reality with this. <laughs> then, then he makes it even crazier. He says to the guy, now you are terrified. He's approaching you with a gun, but this lens, this camera lens is warping everything. We see. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, well, why are you using the damn camera lens? Stop it. So anyway, he says, we have to build you up. We have to build you up. We have to make you higher. So can we have sandbags in here for you to stand on these sandbags? So here I am. I'm like hunchback in Notre Dame. I'm bent down. I'm pointing the gun at the ground. I'm trying not to limp. The other guy is standing on 12 sandbags in the corner. Now I'm not aiming anywhere near me. says, this will look beautiful when you see the final film. <laughs> Except for the fact that I'm, you know, bent over like some kind of hunchback. And the other guy is standing on 12 sandbags. I see the final cut of the film. I'm going like. It looks like he's standing on sandbags. It doesn't look like I'm pointing the gun at him at all. It looks like I just have a terrible case of arthritis. And, you know, you go like, oh, God. So, yeah, you know, you endure those things, but you have no idea until you're in the middle of it. I did oh, I did man. one movie. I did one movie in Canada uh, called Night. Night visitors, and we had a, a very lovely director, but it was it's one of these science fiction you know, science fiction movies always seem to have a scene in it where you go, like, okay, we know this is this is BS, we know this is <laughs> now. We have Leonard Nimoy coming in explaining the space time continuum to us <laughs> how this works. So, in this ridiculous movie, 
mm-hmm. Night Visitor. I play a crazy uh, colonel in the Air Force or something, like I'm a lunatic, right? And I know that aliens exist. And I know that an alien has crash landed in Arizona, and I have captured the alien, and I kill everyone who is a witness to it because for some reason. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but I'm a crazy guy, and, and I have to keep the alien a secret. And Faith Ford is in this movie uh, from uh, Murphy Brown, and it was uh-huh. like her break away from doing a comedy to doing a sci-fi drama in Canada, and she has a kid, and so somehow there's a uh, some sort of confusing scene in it where sh- she... Uh, I kidnap, I kidnap her child. She kidnaps the alien, so <laughs> now she has the alien, and so there has to be a standoff. Yeah. And so, Faith says, like, well, she's reading the script, and she says to the director, "Well, there's no way I would trust him with a straight hostage exchange of the alien for my son unless we do it in a public place." So, without thinking this through clearly. They move the exchange to the uh, Vancouver Art Museum, where there are people walking all over the place, and we're going to exchange the alien, who I've killed, everybody who's seen the alien in the movie, uh, for exchanging for her, her son. And so they start shooting the scene, and I go, wait, now I have a problem. I said, the logic of this movie, if you want to call it that thus far, is I am a homicidal maniac and I kill anyone who's seen the alien. So for some reason, I've agreed to do this swap in a public place where everyone is going to see the alien that I've been killing people for their protection. And the director looked at me and said the horrifying words for an actor to hear, oh dear, you're right. <laughs> So he looks at me and he says, what do we do? And I said, well, at this point, there's only one thing we can do because we've already started shooting the scene. You have like 50 extras walking around here with the alien. We have to put the alien in a crate and have an alien detector. (laughs) And he goes, what? I said, look, it doesn't matter. It's a piece of phony scientific equipment that I have to where I give her the kid, she gives me a crate, and I wave this gadget in front of the crate and look at the reading, and it says alien, (laughs) whatever that reading is. It's like in Godzilla, right? They had the Geiger counter, you know, the the jet, they're on the mountain, they're (laughs) Godzilla is here. (laughs) So it's the same thing with the alien detector. And and the director says, well, what do we use as an alien? I said, Talk to the electricians on the show. They got to have something. So they gave me uh, not an amperage meter, a decibel decibel meter from the sound truck, and it actually had a, a, a scale on it that went from C to A. So if there was, if if I push one button, it went from zero <laughs> to A. And so they said, so the director said, this is fabulous. So now we can have a close up of the alien detector going from zero to A to indicate alien. And he goes, oh, but then what is C? (laughs) And I said, crustacean. C would be for crustacean. So it's either an alien or, or a shrimp. It's one of the two. That's what this does so this movie (laughs) was shot with this ridiculous scene in it and it was on nbc uh night visitor whatever and i said now i gotta wait for the cards and letters from the viewers to come in to go what the hell is an alien detector what is that not one viewer commented on the alien detector everybody was certain (laughs) that they had seen one or that science was just on the verge along with the coronavirus cure of having an alien detector and we're (laughs) going to be in good shape. So that ended up in the movie. So you end up in movies like that and you go like, oh God, is this the end of my career right now? Is this it? 
Yeah, it's got to be so difficult not knowing, you know, I guess the script is the number one thing you look for to be yes. good yes. first, right? Right. You start with the script. If that's good, at least the odds are better that this will and the director, I guess you said, uh, having a good, you know, director. Yeah. Uh, now, now, now you you have spoken to Jim Beaver. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yes. I was going to bring him up, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Loved so the one Beaver, of my favorite we did. Uh, Beaver is a great actor. Beaver is a great writer. And I've had the good fortune of doing, uh, working with Beaver as an actor in In Country for sure. And I feel like we've done something else. I, I know we go- Deadwood. Wait, dead, oh, of course, Deadwood. And and he helped me so much on Deadwood. He, he was like- Oh, really? My guardian angel because oh, working with man. David Milch was crazy. But definitely Deadwood. But I feel like- you know, Jim and I go so far back. That's and true. Uh, he has the same sort of thing when I looked at his, right? It was like, oh, my gosh, Jim's been in everything, you know, uh, for sure. There's probably something y'all have crossed on, you know. Yeah, you know. and and when, when Beaver, you know, he is definitely of the school. He looks at a script, and he ain't fooling around. You know, Beaver is able to look at a script and go like, well, well, this isn't going to work. You know, he'll <laughs> he'll see it right away. And uh, he understands the beauties of a script and he understands where it's going to fall apart before you get to that point. So it's always great to work on a project with Beaver. You know, he's terrific. Yeah, that's awesome. I follow him on social media too because he he writes these such inspiring things to be honest with you. He really he's such a great writer like you said. Mm -hmm. He pulls out these quotes too. I mean, he just really you learn something, right? Just not an opinion. He just throws out a you know, whatever. He he puts something down. I really yeah, really really enjoyed him and he's uh, another phenomenal actor. Uh, as well. Um, you know, what What was it? Yeah, I'm curious about Deadwood. We talked about Deadwood a little bit with Jim, but what your experience on on Deadwood and how did you know or did you have any inclination that this, you know, was going to be what it was for you, you know, or did you I guess you said uh, Jim was your guardian angel on set, you know, was Westerns like was it a Western thing? I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. I guess your thoughts on all. Of well, well, Deadwood had already I went in on season two and three. Yeah, yeah. Deadwood had already developed the reputation of being like some whacked out crazy Western yeah. show, like a cult <laughs> sort of hit. Yeah. And uh, so I did not get a script. David Milch didn't release any scripts for anyone to see. I had a, a like a one page scene and I had to do that scene and I had no idea who I was talking to or what I was doing or what my character was. I had oh, wow. zero idea. So I auditioned for Deadwood. I got the part. We shoot this scene. I have one scene in a stagecoach with a prostitute. And at the end of the scene, I'm supposed to get out of the stagecoach, but the stagecoach door doesn't open. So I improvise and just climb out the window. I just pull myself up and jump out the window of the stagecoach and dust myself off on the ground and walk in. Oh, cut, cut. Terrific. So the next day, David Milch calls me into his office and he says, first of all, we're just going to take, we're throwing that out. What we did yesterday, we're, we're just, we're throwing that out. But I want to show you what we do here. And I sat down in David Milch's office, and he started showing me scenes from Deadwood. Then he pulls out the Bible of the show. And if, if you don't know what the Bible is, whenever you do a series, the writers put together a prospectus of where they see the story going in the next three, four seasons. Right? Oh, so it, it's, a, okay. it's a, you know, there are pictures in there, the ideas of Deadwood— in season one, you have mud streets. In season two, you have vendors on Main Street. In season three, they're selling vegetables on Main Street, and there's a school, and there is a swing on a tree on Main Street. And David said, this is a story of the beginning of civilization, is what this is. And so we're wow. going to... We're going to throw that first. We're going to redo. We're going to redo your entrance. And then I ended up kind of on the show for a couple of years. And uh, 
not only was Beaver on the show, who who I knew from my college days uh, at S, at SMU, as you know, he was an actor in Dallas at the time, and my girlfriend at the time was Beth Henley, who ended up winning the Pulitzer, and uh, oh. yep, yeah, go figure, and <laughs> and uh, and her premiere of her play crimes of the heart was done at the actors theater of louisville at the same time beaver was having a premiere of his play there and i remember meeting jim in the bar at louisville like at the beginning so i had beaver on the set and powers booth was from smu so oh, really Power, powers oh, i didn't know that yeah powers was our classmate at smu and he was like the big star uh, yeah. He was a graduate student that came in when we were all like sophomores or something. And and so we knew Powers really well uh, from SMU. And so, so, and over the years, over the years, Powers and I had acted together and kept up. And so it was, it was old home week being on the set with Beaver and with Powers. And then Powers got his daughter Pam to be the head prostitute at his saloon. So this is just the way that paternalism works in Hollywood. You get your daughter to be the head prostitute. <laughs> now, <laughs> Pam uh, had to have sex with me in a bathtub uh, in, in one of the seasons I did with Deadwood, and she was very nervous. And... I was saying, Pam, just remember in the past, we've been in hot tubs and stuff before, and nothing's going to happen. Absolutely nothing's going to happen, except it could be the end of our reputations, but that'll come later. But just, this is just, just remember, just have, this is like nothing. This is, this is like nothing. Now, Pam Booth, when I used to go over to, uh, uh, well, that's Paris. Paris was his daughter. Pam Powers and Pam were married. Paris was their daughter. She was the head prostitute because they're all PB. Powers Booth, Pam Booth, Paris Booth. Oh, wow. So, so, so when Powers and Pam were married at SMU, Paris was a little baby. And so I used to go over to Powers and Pam's house to drink beer, and, and Pam was talking about making stained glass windows and Pam is just a brilliant, brilliant woman, and Powers did very well in marrying her. She is just splendid. And so Paris was a baby. And so there were times when we'd be over there, and Powers and Pam would say, would you mind changing the diaper with Paris? So in my life, I had changed Paris's diaper when she was a few weeks old. And at the same time, was having sex with her now in a bathtub in Hollywood. Now, that, if, if you were to say in a universe of probability or a universe of cause and effect, in a universe of probability, it's got to be one in 20 trillion <laughs> that that would ever happen. But, uh, oh, man. But but last That's time I true. saw Paris and Pam was when Powers passed and oh. uh, at at his uh, his funeral and Powers was a great actor and he was a great great man and a great great friend and and he was he was the first one of us SMU people to kind of be a success with his Jim Jones thing yeah uh, and every SAG was on I they were on some sort of strike. And Powers would said, I'm going to go to the Emmy Awards. You know, it's like, hey, I've been nominated. You know, they're throwing a party for us to hell with the hell with the union. And, you know, this is what I'm doing. And Powers won. And there was, is there going to be this huge backlash? But he was our hero. He was our standard bearer. And uh, that's awesome. That was a beautiful marriage, Powers and Pam. And Paris is still like a, magnificent uh go get her you know she gets it done she's an amazing person yeah no that's awesome wow what a great uh what a great story it sounds like um you know in your career you've you've had these moments that sort of come back and come full circle and a lot of those moments 
Yeah, it's it's like the the pool is small, but the pool is deep. And, oh, I like and, that. And you you keep running into these people, like in at our school, Kathy Bates was the best actress at our school. She was a, a junior, I believe. I think a junior, not a senior, when when I was a freshman. So she was like two years ahead of me. And Kathy had trouble being cast because they said, oh, she's not pretty enough or she's not this, she's not that. And they did the show Electra for, for Kathy. But everybody knew Bobo Bates, as they call her, was the best actress at SMU. Everybody knew she was the best. And I remember when my girlfriend, Beth, wrote the play Crimes of the Heart before it won the Pulitzer, but it did win the Great American Play Contest at Louisville. Wow. Uh, Beth went to Louisville and they said, well, the play is precast and I don't know these actors. Uh, they have Kathy Bates as Lenny. I said, Kathy Bates is Lenny? Which is the kind of the lead of the show. I said, if you have Kathy Bates as Lenny, Beth, you don't have to worry about anything because you have one of the greatest actors on the planet in your play. Wow. And, and so from SMU to Louisville and then to New York, uh, the, the stories overlap. And the, the, I don't know if this interests you. Jack Hefner was a writer at SMU and he wrote the play Vanities, which was very successful in New York. And uh, <clears throat> in in the show, Kathy Bates was one of the regulars of the show. And then she had she either had an illness in the family or something. She had to step out of the show for a week. And it was running off Broadway, big success. And her understudy was Pat Richardson, who was also from SMU. Pat Richardson oh. end up as the understudy coming into the show that night, and that was the night ABC and other people sent talent scouts to see the show, and they signed Pat. Nobody saw Kathy. So Kathy is feeling like, I'm doomed. I, I can't do anything. But because of her work at Louisville in Crimes of the Heart, Marcia Norman who was the big writer at Louisville, wrote a little play f called Night Mother for Kathy to play, uh, play, play the lead in Night Mother. And so that play went to Broadway, and Kathy went from getting screwed out of the off-Broadway job yeah. she had and Pat getting the job to doing Night Mother on Broadway getting all the accolades of that show, Rob Reiner sees that play and immediately casts her in misery, and she wins an Academy Award. Wow. So it's like the pool is small, but the pool is deep. Wow, that's You keep crazy. running into the same people all the time, and different stories happen. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, what a trajectory that she had. I didn't realize it was like that. You know. Yeah, and she it was like failure, failure, failure. Now I'm the most successful actress in America. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Misery was. How, I remember when it came out. And how many Academy Awards has she won? I think she's won like three or something, three or five. I don't know. But <laughs> when yeah, last time I, I've done three movies with with Kathy in, in my career. And last time I saw her, she, she's living at some house in Provence or something. You know, she's, she's living the dream. Good and, for her. Yeah, but of course, she's brilliant, yeah. just like Powers was brilliant. You know, they're brilliant actors, so quality w will come forward. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's, you know, that's amazing. Um, I, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up, um, you know, a role that you probably get shouted out in the street all the time from uh, Groundhog Day, obviously. Is that probably the movie that most people come up to you about, you think? Right. Uh, before the pandemic... At least three times a day, people would come up to me in grocery stores on the street. Bing! Has anyone ever said that to you? And 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 I go, well, only two other people today. But now with the pandemic and the masks, yeah. since I have the masks in the grocery store, they don't usually recognize me. 
so it's the rare occasion now where I'm wearing the mask and somebody goes, Ding! Has anyone <laughs> ever said that to you? And I go, yes, yes, they used to say that before the pandemic. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah the, that is so funny that is so funny yeah that, that's gotta be crazy too i can't imagine going through life and having just random people come up to you and shout something that you did you know 30 years ago yeah um, and, and i was it was this last january right before the world began to end and my <laughs> i'm starting to do one day at a time we were starting season four of one day at a time yeah and and my manager calls me at work and says, uh, we may have to get you out of town. Uh, they want to shoot a commercial this weekend. And I go, where? And they go, either New York or Chicago. I said, impossible. It's impossible. We have a network run through of our first episode on Friday. And then we have camera blocking on Monday and we shoot in front of a live audience Tuesday. It's impossible. There's no way to fly across the country, Chicago, shoot something or what a commercial and come back. And I said, okay, this is the deal. I'll do it if I'm able to get to wherever we're getting to Friday night. We shoot Saturday, and I have all day Sunday to come back. I'll do it. And then my manager called back and said, well, it's a commercial for Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. And it's for Jeep, and it's for the Super Bowl. And I said, oh, oh God, okay, okay. So <laughs> I, I – I run after our network run through. I get on an earlier plane that I was supposed to take. I get to my hotel outside of Woodstock, Illinois at 1130 at night. And Bill and I meet in the bar. And then we commiserate for about an hour of good times and fun and telling groundhog stories. We shoot all day Saturday. I start flying back from Woodstock, Illinois. We stop at O'Hare Airport to change planes, and I'm going like, who are all these people with masks? Chinese people with masks. This is weird. This is like science fiction. And I'm going like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm saying there are thousands of people in O'Hare Airport wearing masks, Chinese people. And I'm going like, this is, there's something happening. So I try to self-isolate, not knowing what's going on. I end up on the plane, and it's the same day Kobe Bryant was killed Oh, in the helicopter. Yeah. So yeah. This, is, this is the news on the flight. Nobody's talking about any virus or anything. They're talking about Kobe Bryant. We land, and, and that was the people from Sony said, where did you go in such a hurry after the run-through? And I told them about the Super Bowl commercial. And the vice president of Sonny said, Stephen, if I had known you were going to Chicago to shoot a commercial with Bill Murray for Groundhog Day, we would have insisted you go. We would have arranged a car for you to go there. This is fantastic, not for your career, but for your life. This is what you've got to do. And I'm saying, you know, and this is, this is one of the things that's made Sony such a great studio in my heart for for the last you know several years i've been doing a lot of work at sony and it's like a second home to me it's it's so phenomenal those people Ugh. that's great yeah that's great wow that's uh that's amazing um you know yeah i remember that that super bowl uh, commercial actually yeah for sure that was that uh how long had it been since you'd seen bill since had it been a while Oh, really? Yeah. And the director said, okay, uh, and we're in a snowstorm now. When we shot the movie, it was cold. But now yeah. Bill and I, for the commercial, are in a snowstorm. And he says, so Bill, you come around the corner, and Stephen, you come up and do the scene that you did with him. And Bill and I, like, look at one another, look at him and says, we haven't done this scene <laughs> in 20 years. We don't know what we did. Well, well he just said, thought y'all would remember it. Yeah. He just thought, yeah. There was no script for, for the commercial. So just do this. And so I looked at Bill and said, well, let's make something, something up. So we just made up whatever. So we can. And I just said, well, I know. I said, am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Bing. Whatever the people said to me in the supermarket is what I said to Bill Murray. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love that. That is so crazy. Wow, I can't believe uh, they wouldn't have a script or something uh, for something like that. I guess you never just seems to me yeah that's crazy but they had ingenious camera people because yeah. that you know those directors the camera people shot that commercial shot per shot the way we shot the movie and not yeah. only that they went to the enormous expense at redoing woodstock illinois everything that was in frame they redid the fronts of the building so it looked exactly like it did in the movie because oh, time, no. times have changed yeah. So they yeah. rechanged the color of the brick. They put up different awnings. They put up different windows. Everything so it would look exactly like the movie. Wow, that is that is absolutely that's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Wow, that's detail. I love uh, hearing uh, work like that when you hear a b behind the scenes of a film or something, and you see how much they put into it because it really <laughs> does show up on screen uh even if as a fan or a viewer like myself watching it may not know what you know there's something there you, you know yes. it's mad you know like you eat a good steak yes. you don't necessarily know have to know <laughs> how to how to make it great but you know it's great you know yes yes yeah i love that that is so cool that that's amazing uh, you know i'm curious uh you know we, we uh, this will be my last question steven um well actually wanted to anything that you wanted to talk about. I know you're doing some like live. I saw your stuff on YouTube, which I love, by the way, of, of your live storytelling. Fantastic. Re well, really the, enjoy the, that. The pandemic has been good for the fact that I have nothing to do with my life. And so <laughs> I've been, <clears throat> I brought back, you know, we did this podcast, the Tobolowsky Files. I'll yeah. Looking, you know, that it's been, that it began with SlashFilm.com as a movie podcast. Like I'm the guy who's, in all these movies so talk about what it's like to be a supporting character in all these movies and so i wrote three of those episodes we recorded fourth episode my mother got a had a heart attack and i had to fly to dallas and she passed away the next morning oh, and sorry. i wrote the story of my mother the last moment of my mother's life so i wrote this story and I called up my producer and said, well, I don't have a movie story this week. I have a different story. And so that story became called The Alchemist. And it was the fourth story we recorded for the Tobolowsky Files. And that story went all over the world. Uh, from then on, the producer said, write whatever you want to write. Forget the movie stories. Yeah. So, yeah, we have the story about Stevie Ray Vaughan in there. And, yes, somewhere we have the story about the alien in there, somewhere like that. But <laughs> We have 99 podcast episodes now. Each one's about an hour long with various true stories about life, love, and Hollywood. And they come out Monday morning. And they're free. They're totally free. We did it absolutely free because we wanted nobody pulling our chains. So yeah. David Chin, who's in Seattle now, and I, and what I do is I write these stories, I record them, and, and then David and I... Uh, kind of chat about them before and after and most of the stories are funny but some of them are not some yeah. of them are about villains some of them are about the passing of my mother some are about heartbreak or one i was held hostage at gunpoint in a grocery store i have that story i have oh the my story God. of my open heart surgery that story getting lost in the mountains with my young son that story so they're all true stories and they're all interconnected by the fact that it's one person's life so it's become like one of these weird movies. Now, after, after 10 years and 99 episodes, it's become these weird movies. Someone wrote, a critic wrote an article about it called The Serialized Man, that it is this mosaic of a human life that's completely out of order. There's no chronology to it. Yeah. There's nothing. Oh, I see. I see. And, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing to it. And so the listener kind of puts the chronology together and the, and the only thing they, and there is a kind of background for this. And that is Maxim Gorky. Uh, he had three magnificent books called uh, My Childhood is One, My Apprentices, My Apprenticeships and My Universities. And in these Gorky writes these incredible short stories, all true, not in chronological order, and the stories themselves aren't in chronological order. Sometimes the end will be at the beginning or the end will be in the middle, and 
as a reader, I was going like, this is fantastic. You don't, it's an artificial construct to say a story is in a chronological order because that isn't the way the mind works. So that's the way the Tobolowsky Files works. And so there's that. So you just have to go to tobolowskyfiles.com. That's pretty simple. And, and there's also, as you say, some, uh, and there are going to be more live storytelling from before the pandemic on that side as well. So people can enjoy that uh, to pass the time in the pandemic. Oh, love that. Absolutely. I mean, now's a great time to get content out and for to absorb content as a person, yeah. right? Like, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I've been rewatching stuff that I haven't seen in years over the last, you know, eight months, uh, to be honest with you, caught up on all kinds of crazy, oh, yeah. right? Films and books and TV shows and nothing as well. Just enjoying <laughs> life without any of that as well. Uh, with my wife and my dogs and you know that that sort of thing uh, just just life in general uh, sometimes we don't get a chance to stop slow down right uh, t take in life um, so yeah that, that has been nice to some right. extent you know uh, well Stephen listen I I really appreciate um, uh, all the time you've you've spent with us today these stories have been just absolutely magnificent I, I can't tell you that i'm sure you you know you probably make an impact on i know you make an impact on a lot of people uh but you've made quite an impact on me today and these stories are just absolutely magnificent i know our listeners are going to be super excited about these stories i can't wait to get this episode out and i just really appreciate you taking the time uh uh to talk to us really well really thank do. you Th this was a blast it truly was just wonderful and you know, Texas forever, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Well, thank you again, Stephen. Uh, my best to uh, to you and your family uh, during this time. I wish you guys the best and, um, you know, getting through this. And um, yeah, wish you guys the best. Thank you so much again. You got it, man. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Yeah.